guys. Um, back to video lectures. You had a couple days without. Sorry, I was distracted by a truck that just drove by. Um, I just went for a walk and it's cold out. So if I'm coughing, it is not because I have the virus. Um, so just want to let you know that. So we're going to do chapter 15. This is the first chapter in our new unit five energy unit. Um, I'm going to get as far as I can. Oh, shoot, I forgot to set my timer again. I'll set it for 14. Because YouTube only allows certain length videos. So when it goes off, i got to stop, and then we'll like just kind of like chunk it out. So first thing I kind of want to talk about is just energy use in general. <clears throat> this is as of 2017. This is the uh, most recent information I could find, published in 2018. Um, but kind of look at the divide and how we use our energy. So we're going to talk about petroleum and natural gas and coal. Um, actually, the old... The old data I had on here that I just took down was from 2012, and coal was at 28%. So we used to be getting about a third of our energy from coal. Now we're getting 14%. In fact, emissions in general have dropped because we're switching to natural gas and we're switching to petroleum. We also, um, nuclear power is about the same. We haven't really built any new plants, and renewables are going up. So the first thing we kind of have to talk about is net energy yield. This is number one. We are going to refer to this over and over and over. Um, you might also see or hear when you do your presentations the term E R O I. That's energy return on investment. Um, it's a very similar idea. But basically, what you're looking at is how much energy is available from a resource. And then you have to take away the energy that you use to make it, to mine it, to process it and whatnot. Okay, so some energy sources are really high. <coughs> um, hydroelectric, wind, coal. Some are low, like biomass burning, which is like burning wood or burning poop, to be honest. And some are negative, like nuclear. So some sources can't compete. These are the ones that are going to need subsidies, which we talked about last lecture. Okay, so number two asks why some energy resources need subsidies. They have low net energy yield, people. Low net energy yield. Here you go. There's your answer. They have low net energy yield, and they need those subsidies. You can put an example as nuclear. We're also going to learn about hydrogen fuel cells. So the reason is that uranium fuel cell is costly, okay? Um, the medium ones we're gonna learn about, petroleum, um, so light oil, kind of traditional oil, natural gas, geothermal, solar, and then the low ones are ethanol, which is made from corn, biodiesel, and then we're gonna learn about some different kinds of oil, like heavy oil, which is from shale or tar sands. So we're gonna start with oil in general. Look at number three. Let's define crude oil or define petroleum. So it's basically the same thing. Um, when you get it out of the ground, like when you drill it from a rig, it's this gooey, viscous stuff. Um, and you're looking at these big chains of C's and H's, hydrocarbons, they're called. And when you break the bonds in the hydrocarbons, you're releasing energy. So it's combustible. You've got some sulfur, you've got some nitrogen, you've got some impurities in there as well. But the hydrocarbons aren't making a good energy source. Now, out of the ground in general is not something you want to put into your engine, okay? So, we're going to talk about um, refining it, but first let's talk about how to find it, basically. So, they use um, big machines to pound the earth. They send shock waves deep underground, and they measure how long it takes to get the shock waves back, and that's how they kind of find it. They make these 3D maps of where these locations are. It's called exploratory drilling, right? Exploratory drilling. When you remove it then, um, you're drilling holes and you're pumping it. So I don't know how like showing a video works on here. We're gonna try. I don't know if you have audio or not have audio. I have audio, but that's in Texas. Okay, I'm, I'm sure you've seen on movies or maybe even in person what drilling for oil looks like. That's what it looks like. Oh, oh. Maybe that didn't work. We'll see. 
Um, so again, we can't use it as it comes out of the ground. We have to refine it. I really encourage you to watch the video. It tells you how they do it, but it's um, a complex process. This is what you're writing for number four. Complex process where crude oil is heated and separated into various fuels. And I want you to list some of the fuels. Gasoline, diesel, plane fuel, so aviation fuel, and then you get some other products from it. Asphalt, grease, wax. You're also going to get some byproducts and petrochemicals. Okay, so they're sometimes used for like cleaning products and they're sometimes disposed of. So what you can put for petrochemicals for five is just byproducts created from refining crude oil. All right, we're on the other side. I'm going to flip to the next slide in my lecture. And so number six, what countries produce the most oil? Dan, you want to answer? Where do we get our oil from? Middle East. Middle East. Number one is Saudi Arabia. You can write number one is Saudi Arabia. That's 13.2%. Number two is Russia, and number three is actually the U.S. You should be able to find these on the map. We can absolutely practice when we get back. Um, how about top oil consumers? Dan, yeah, what do you think? Top oil consumer. United States is number one. You want to keep going? No. No, okay. Chloe, you want to guess? Which country uses the most gasoline? Which country has a lot of people? Okay. My family doesn't want to play along when I have something in my eye. Say it louder. China. China. China's number two. I don't want something in my eye. Sorry. <laughs> and then number three, even though it's small, is Japan. All right. Um, so that should be number six that you answered. Number seven asks about five factors that are going to contribute to oil availability. I'm going to show you a couple pictures first, and then we're going to get there. So the first picture is of the oil refinery. I kind of like that. Excited, I went ahead because I like that part. So here it shows you how it's heated, and then the boiling point, as it gets higher and higher and higher and higher, you you get like purer and purer product. So asphalt's kind of like the crappy bottom stuff. And then natural gas you can actually get from petroleum. That's going to be the, the best stuff. So that's kind of a diagram of that. What this shows is Baytown, which is an oil refinery in Texas. It's the biggest in the world. I actually have a former student right now that's a chemical engineering major at Madison that is doing his internship there right now. But that's what that video is about if you want to watch that linked video in the shared lecture. So back to contributing to oil availability. First of all is demand, right? Economic supply and demand. So are we running out? Well, it depends how much we need. And it depends on the technology to make it available. That, in turn, affects the rate at which we're removing it and then the cost. Um, we know that cost is dropping right now because of COVID-19 or coronavirus causing that because people aren't driving. They're, like, staying home. And so demand is dropping and now our price is dropping, even though the supply isn't really changing. Last lecture, we talked about market price. That's also going to affect it if gas is super expensive. People don't buy it as much. So number eight then talks about proven oil reserves. So this is like, like we know it's there. So it's available deposits, which we can get out the oil at current price with current technology. It's not speculation. Okay, not speculation. This is back again from last lecture. So how do we get it out? Um, look at the table. So this is where we start talking about fracking. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Mm, okay, let's see what we can do. All right, so horizontal drilling. So horizontal drilling, you first drill to a certain point. Then you're going to bend this flexible well bore and go horizontal to get. Now you can get oil from this. You can also get natural gas. Fracking takes the horizontal drilling idea and expands on it. So basically what happens with fracking is you drill down, you put explosives down there, you set off the explosive, which creates fissures in the rocks, which are tiny little cracks. 
You then take a pump and you pump this fracking liquid down there, which is a mixture of water and sand and chemicals, which fracture it more, which releases petroleum and natural gas. Okay, so this is, this is a big thing in the U.S. This is where oil is kind of hard to get out. And so, geez, okay, so you defined it in your table. Can you either get a post-it or another sheet or something? Maybe pause me. And let's talk a little bit. Let's talk about environmental problems with fracking. So first of all, the explosives themselves that you create the initial fissures with can actually cause earthquakes. It's so like, that's an issue. Secondly, you put those liquids down. Those liquids can contaminate drinking water, groundwater. You see there's an aquifer down here in this tiny little diagram. If that aquifer gets contaminated by fracking liquid, the entire area that depends on the aquifer will have that liquid in their groundwater. It can also contaminate surface water. Oftentimes, like the waste fracking liquid is just like sprayed on roads and now it's runoff. Um, the other big issue, which you're going to see a picture on the next page, um, the natural gas can also seep into the aquifer. The oil can too, but natural gas is kind of harder to control. And so it's going to be a picture of a lady lighting her water on fire. Okay, that natural gas is fizzing from the faucet in a Pennsylvania home from fracking in the area. I think you can tell from the home and maybe just by how she's dressed that this is a lower socioeconomic area, which is often the case in terms of where fracking is happening. So that's an environmental justice kind of concern that we can discuss. Um, she has to leave the windows open year round so her house doesn't blow up. And it gets cold in Pennsylvania. Another issue is that we're using way too much water with the fracking liquid, so we know depletion of groundwater is a thing. Um, and then noise pollution, it's loud. Okay. Um, finally, subsidence and sinkholes can be a problem. So I really want you to jot down those negatives. You're gonna have to write about this at some point when we finally get back to school. All right, so number 10, let's see, where are we at? Two minutes. Um, that was number nine. Number 10, you're asked about the consumption versus the production of light oil. So recently, there's been talk of drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and there was a ban on it. It's a wilderness area. Our current president has lifted that ban. Um, he wants a domestic source of oil. Look at, at the bottom here how much oil is there compared to the projected consumption of our oil. So number 10 asks, what can you conclude? Here's what I wrote. The amount of oil actually found in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in Alaska is only a fraction of what we're gonna need in the next few decades. Is it worth sacrificing this wilderness to access that fossil fuel? And like, that's a question that you have to answer. There's no right answer to that, but that's number 10. Here's a map kind of just showing you what that wildlife refuge looks like on the top left. The bottom right now is the Dakota Access um, Pipeline, which was in the news four years ago, maybe. And the idea is that um, there were these oil shell fields in North Dakota, which is up here, and they're gonna be transporting this oil through a pipeline. It's very easily transportable. But that pipeline was gonna be going through native areas, burial grounds, and water quality issues. So it was a human rights thing. Hi, Casey. Hi. Um, that, it's still in the news. I believe they did build the pipeline talking about leaking and contaminating groundwater and whatnot. So I think we're going to stop here um, and continue with the next slides on the next video. So we are on slide 10, people. We are on slide 10, which was number 10 as well.